face stone is seen in a mirror illustrates the space behind the mirror. The visual delusions arising from some delirium, or some imaginative excitement, illustrate surrounding spatial regions, analogously for the double vision due to maladjustment of the eyes. The sight at night, of the stars in nebulae and Milky Way, illustrates vague regions of the contemporary sky, the feelings in amputated limbs illustrate spaces beyond the actual body, a bodily pain, referred to some part not the cause of the disorder, illustrates the painful region though not the pain giving region. All these are perfectly good examples of the pure mode of presentational immediacy. The epithet, delusive, which fits many, if not all, of these examples of presentational immediacy, is evidence that the mediating eternal object is not to be ascribed to the donation of the perceived region. It must have acquired its ingression in this mode from one of the originative phases of the percipient occasion. To this extent, the philosophy of organism is in agreement with the 17th century doctrine of primary and secondary qualities, the mediating eternal object being, in this mode of ingression, a secondary quality. But in the philosophy of organism the doctrine does not have the consequences which follow in the earlier philosophies. The account of perception in the pure mode of presentational immediacy, which has just been given, agrees absolutely with Descartes' doctrine of perception in general, so far as can be judged from his arguments which presuppose perception, and putting aside a few detached, 187 passages wherein he comes near to the doctrine of objectification, and near to Locke's second doctrine of ideas determined to particular existence. Anyhow, his conclusion immediately follows that, in perception, thus described, all that is perceived is that the object has extension and is implicated in a complex of extensive relatedness with the animal body of the percipient. Part of the difficulties of Cartesian philosophy, and of any philosophy which accepts this account as a complete account of perception, is to explain how we know more than this meager fact about the world although our only avenue of direct knowledge limits us to this barren recidium. Also, if this be all that we perceive about the physical world, we have no basis for ascribing the origination of the mediating sensa to any functioning of the human body. We are thus driven to the Cartesian duality of substances, bodies and minds. Perception is to be ascribed to mental functioning in respect to the barren extensive universe. We have already done violence to our immediate conviction by thus thrusting the human body out of the story, for, as Hume himself declares, we know that we see by our eyes, and taste by our palates. But when we have gone so far, it is inevitable to take a further step, and to discard our other conviction that we are perceiving a world of actual organisms and environment, 123. Things within which we find ourselves. For a barren, extensive world is not really what we mean. We thus reduce perceptions to consciousness of impressions on the mind, consisting of sense with, manners, of related till the nest. We then come to Hume, and to Kant. Kant's philosophy is an end till the deaver to retrieve some meaning for the two convictions which we have successively discarded. We have noted that Locke wavers in his account of perception, so that in the earlier portion of his essay he agrees with Hume, and in the later portion with the philosophy of organism. We have also noted that Hume is inconsistent to the extent of arguing from a convict tilde on which is discarded in his philosophy. 
Section 8 188 Presentational immediacy illustrates the contemporary world and Ray Tilda spec to its potentiality for extensive subdivision into atomic actualities and in respect to the scheme of perspective relationships which thereby eventuates. But it gives no information as to the actual atomization of this contemporary, real potentiality. By its limitations it exemplifies the doctrine, already stated above, that the contemporary world happens independently of the actual occasion with which it is contemporary. This is in fact the definition of contemporaneousness cf. Part 2, ch. 2, sect. I, namely, that actual occasions, a and b, are mutually contemporary, when it does not contribute to the datum for B, and B does not contribute to the datum for A, except that both A and B are atomic regions in the potential scheme of spatio-temporal extensiveness which is a datum for both A and B. Hume's polemic respecting causation is, in fact, one prolonged, convincing argument that pure presentational immediacy does not disclose any causal influence, either whereby one actual entity is constitutive of the percipient actual entity, or whereby one perceived actual entity is constitutive of another perceived actual entity. The conclusion is that, in so far as concerns their disclosure by presentational immediacy, Actual entities in the contemporary universe are causally independent of each other. The two pure modes of perception in this way disclose a variety of loci defined by reference to the percipient occasion M. For example, there are the actual occasions of the settled world which provide the datum for M. These lie in M's causal past. Again, there are the potential occasions for which M decides its own potentialities of contribution to their data, these lie in M's causal future. There are also those actual occasions which lie neither in M's causal past, nor in M's causal future. Such actual occasions are called M's contemporaries. These P89 3 loci are defined solely by reference to the pure mode of causal efficacy. We now turn to the pure mode of presentational immediacy. One great difference from the previous way of obtaining loci at once comes into view. In considering the causal mode, the past and the future were death. 124 Discussions and Applications Find positively, and the contemporaries of M were defined negatively as lying neither in M's past nor in M's future. In dealing with presentational immediacy the opposite way must be taken. For presentational immediacy gives positive information only about the immediate present as defined by itself. Presentational immediacy illustrates, by means of sensa, potential subdivisions within a cross-section of the world, which is in this way objectified for M. This cross-section is M's immediate present. What is in this way illustrated is the potentiality for subdivision into actual atomic occasions, we can also recognize potentialities for subdivision of regions whose subdivisions remain unillustrated by any contrast of sensa. There are well-known limitations to such direct perceptions of unillustrated potentiality, a perception outrunning the real illustration of division by con. Trusted sensa. Such limitations constitute the minima sensibilia. Hume's polemic respecting causation constitutes a proof that M's immediate present lies within the locus of M's contemporaries. The presentation to M of this locus, forming its immediate present, 
contributes to M's datum two facts about the universe. One fact is that there is a unison of becoming, constituting a positive relation of all the occasions in this community to any one of them. The members of this community share in a common immediacy, they are in unison, as to their becoming, that is, to say, any pair of occasions in the locus are contemporaries. The other fact is the subjective illustration of the potential extensive subdivision with complete vagueness respecting the actual atomization. For example, the stone, which in the immediate 190 present is a group of many actual occasions, is illustrated as one gray spatial region. But, to go back to the former fact, the many actual entities of the present stone and the percipient are connected together in the unison of immediate becoming. This community of concrescent occasions, forming M's immediate present, thus establishes a principle of common relatedness, a principle realized as an element in M's datum. This is the principle of mutual relatedness in the unison of becoming. But this mutual relatedness is independent of the illustration by those sensitive through which presentational immediacy for M is effected. Also the illustration by these sensa has unequal relevance for M throughout the locus. In its spatially remote parts it becomes vaguer and vaguer, fainter and fainter, and yet the principle of unison of becoming still holds in despite of the fading importance of the sensa. We thus find that the locus namely, M's immediate present is determined by the condition of mutual unison, independently of variations of relevant importance in M's illustrative sensa, and extends to their utmost bounds of faintness, and is equally determined beyond such bounds. We thus gain the conception of a locus in which any two atomic actualities are in concrescent unison, and which is particularized by the fact that M belongs to it, and so do all actual occasions belonging to extensive regions which lie in M's immediate present as illustrated by importantly relevant sensa. This complete region is the prolongation of M's immediate present, organisms and environment. 125 beyond M's direct perception, the prolongation being effected by the principle of concrescent unison. A complete region, satisfying the principle of concrescent unison, will be called a duration. A duration is a cross-section of the universe, it is the immediate present condition of the world at some epoch, according to the old, classical, theory of time a theory never doubted until within the last few years. It will have been seen that the philosophy of organism accepts and defines this 191 notion. Some measure of acceptance is imposed upon metaphysics. If the notion be wholly rejected no appeal to universal obviousness of conviction can have any weight, since there can be no stronger instance of this force of obviousness. The classical theory of time tacitly assumed that a duration included the directly perceived immediate present of each one of its members. The converse proposition certainly follows from the account given above, that the immediate present of each actual occasion lies in a duration. An actual occasion will be said six to be, progredient with, or, stationary in, the duration including its directly perceived immediate present. The actual occasion is included in its own immediate present, so that each actual occasion through its percipience in the pure mode of presentational immediacy if such percipience has important relevance defines one duration in which it is included. The percipient occasion is 
stationary in this duration. But the classical theory also assumed the converse of this statement. It assumes that any actual occasion only lies in one duration, so that if n lies in the duration including m's immediate present, then m lies in the duration including n's immediate present. The philosophy of organism, in agreement with recent physics, rejects this conversion, though it holds that such rejection is based on scientific examination of our cosmic epic, and not on any more general metaphysical principle. According to the philosophy of organism, in the present cosmic epic only one duration includes all M's immediate present, this one duration will be called M's presented duration. But M itself lies in many durations, each duration including M also includes some portions of M's presented duration. In the case of human perception practically all the important portions are thus included. Also in human experience the relationship to such dura 192 tions is what we express by the notion of movement. To sum up this discussion, in respect to any one actual occasion M there are three distinct nexes of occasions to be considered. I the nexus of all contemporaries, defined by the characteristic that M and any one of its contemporaries happen in causal independence of each other. E durations including M, T any such duration is defined by the characteristic that any two of its members are contemporaries. It follows that 6 CF, my principles of natural knowledge, CH, 11, and my concept of nature, CH, versus, 126, discussions and applications. Any member of such a duration is contemporary with M, and then that such durations are all included in the locus I. The characteristic property of a duration is termed tunison of becoming. E M's presented locus, which is the contemporary nexus perceived in the mode of presentational immediacy, with its regions defined by sensa. It is assumed, on the basis of direct intuition, that M's presented locus is closely related to some one duration including M. It is also assumed, as the outcome of modern physical theory, that there is more than one duration including M. The single duration which is so related to M's presented locus is termed TM's presented duration. But this connection is criticized in the following sections of this chapter. In part 4, the connection of these T presented, low to regions defined by straight lines is considered in more detail, the notion of TS train IOC is there introduced. Section X Physical science has recently arrived at the stage in which the practical identification, made in the preceding section, between the T-presented locus of an actual entity, and the locus in tunison of becoming, with the actual entity must be qualified. The two notions, T-presented locus and tunison of becoming, are distinct. The identification merely rests on the obvious experience of daily life. In any recasting of 193 thought, it is obligatory to include the identification as a practical approximation to the truth, sufficient for daily life. Subject to this limitation, there is no reason for rejecting any distinction between them which the evidence suggests. In the first place, the presented locus is defined by some systematic relation to the human body so far as we rely, as we must, upon human experience. 
a certain state of geometrical strain in the body, and a certain qualitative physiological excitement in the cells of the body, govern the whole process of presentational immediacy. In sense perception the whole function of antecedent occurrences outside the body is merely to excite these strains and physiological excitements within the body. But any other means of production would do just as well, so long as the relevant sanctities of the body are in fact produced. The perceptions are functions of the bodily states. The geometrical details of the projected sense perception depend on the geometrical strains in the body, the qualitative sense will depend on the physiological excitements of the requisite cells in the body. Thus the presented locus must be a locus with a systematic geometrical relation to the body. According to all the evidence, it is completely independent of the contemporary actualities which in fact make up the nexus of actualities in the locus. For example, we see a picture on the wall with direct vision. But if we turn our back to the wall, and gaze into a good mirror, we see the same sight as an image behind the mirror. Thus, Given the proper physiological state of the body, the locus presented in sense. Organisms and environment. 127. Perception is independent of the details of the actual happenings which it includes. This is not to satisfy that sense perception is irrelevant to the real world. It demonstrates to us the real extensive continuum in terms of which these contemporary happenings have their own experiences qualified. Its additional information in terms of the qualitative sensa has relevance in proportion to the relevance of the immediate bodily state to the M194 T8 happenings throughout the locus. Both are derived from a past which is practically common to them all. Thus there is always some relevance. The correct interpretation of this relevance is the art of utilizing the perceptive modesty of presentational immediacy as a means for understanding the world as a medium. But the question which is of interest for this discussion is how this systematic relevance of body to presented locus is definable. This is not a mere logical question. The problem is to point out that element in the nature of things constituting such a geometrical relevance of the body to the presented locus. If there be such an element, we can understand that a certain state of the body may lift it into an important factor of our experience. The only possible elements capable of this extended systematic relevance beyond the body are straight lines and planes. Planes are definable in terms of straight lines, so that we can concentrate attention upon straight lines. It is a dogma of science that straight lines are not definable in terms of mere notions of extension. THS, in the expositions of recent physical theory, straight lines are defined in terms of the actual physical happenings. The disadvantage of this doctrine is that there is no method of characterizing the possibilities of physical events antecedently to their actual occurrence. It is easy to verify that in fact there is a tacit relevance to an underlying system, by reference to which the physical loci including those called straight lines are defined. The question is how to define this underlying system in terms of pure straight lines determinable without ref. Errands to the casual details of the happenings. It will be shown later, CF, part 4, CHs, 3 and IV, that this dogma of the indefinability of straight lines is mistaken.
Thus the systematic relation of the body to the presented locus occasions no theoretical difficulty. All measurement is effected by observations of sensa 195 with geometrical relations within this presented locus. Also all scientific observation of the unchanged character of things ultimately depends upon the maintenance of directly observed geometrical analogies within such loci. However far the testing of instruments is carried, finally all scientific interpretation is based upon the assumption of directly observed unchangeability of some instrument for seconds, for hours, for months for years. When we test this assumption we can only use another instrument, and there it cannot be an infinite regress of instruments. Thus ultimately all science depends upon direct observation of HOMO. 128. Discussions and Applications. OGY of status within a system. Also the observed system is the complex of geometrical relations within some presented locus. In the second place, a locus of entities in, unison of becoming, obviously depends on the particular actual entities. The question, as to how the extensive continuum is in fact atomized by the atomic actualities, is relevant to the determination of the locus. The factor of temporal endurance selected for any one actuality will depend upon its initial, subjective aim. The categorial conditions which govern the, subjective aim, are discussed later in Part 3. They consist generally in satisfying some condition of a maximum, to be obtained by the transmission of inherited types of order. This is the foundation of the stationary conditions in terms of which the ultimate formulations of physical science can be mathematically expressed. Thus the loci of unison of becoming are only determinable in terms of the actual happenings of the world. But the conditions which they satisfy are expressed in terms of measurements derived from the qualification of actualities by the systematic character of the extensive continuum. The term, duration, will be used for a locus of, unison of becoming, and the terms, presented locus, and, strain 196 locus for the systematic locus involved in presentational immediacy point 7. The strain loci provide the systematic geometry with its homology of relations throughout all its regions, the durations share in the deficiency of homology characteristic of the physical field which arises from the peculiarities of the actual events. Section X we can now sum up this discussion of organisms, order, societies, T nexus. The aim of the philosophy of organism is to express a coherent cosmology based upon the notions of system, process, creative advance into novelty, res vera, in Descartes' sense stubborn fact, individual unity of experience, feeling, time is perpetual perishing, endurance is recreation, purpose, universals is forms of definiteness, particulars i.e., res vera is ultimate agents of stubborn fact. Every one of these notions is explicitly formulated either by Descartes or by Locke. Also no one can be dropped without doing violence to common sense. But neither Descartes nor Locke weaves these notions into one coherent system of cosmology. In so far as either philosopher is systematic, he relies on alternative notions which in the end lead to Hume's extreme of sensationalism. In the philosophy of organism it is held that the notion of organism, 
has two meanings, interconnected but intellectually separable, namely, the microscopic meaning and the macroscopic meaning. The microscopic. Seven in the concept of nature these two loci were not discriminated, namely, durations and strain loci. Organisms and environment.